John and looking at different things. So some of these will, uh, you'll be reminded of these, but there are, well, Schofield likes to point out that there's seven of them. I don't know the significance of that, <laughs> but uh, there's seven I am declarations. Where Jesus says, I am the this or that. Okay, start in verse, in chapter six, verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay, so then he says it again in verse 41, 48, 51. Look at chapter 8. Verse 12, then Jesus, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Chapter 10, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Chapter 10, he says that again, verse 7, verse 9. Chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. Uh, says again in 14. And then chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. <clears throat> and uh, chapter 14. Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right, and then we come to chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the, the, the vine. Now, all the first six that I just read to you, the first six clearly deal with salvation. I'm the bread of life. He that believeth in me. And interesting how many times they all say believe, too. Because we understand, you know, the Gospel of John is a gospel track to the lost. I mean, it's not to the law; it's not written to the lost, but it's something that we would use to show the lost, like, "Hey, this is how you get saved." And so, uh, believe, believe, believe. I think it's like a hundred times. One time I preached a series where we went through all the times where the where the Book of John says believe, and we preached on those con on that context. But <clears throat> I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I'm the door to the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, truth, and the, the way, the truth, and the life. All those are clearly talking about salvation. There's no other way to receive salvation but through Jesus. But then we come to this one where he says, I am the, the true vine, and my father is the husband. And every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Okay? <clears throat> I don't believe that there's any reason to interpret this as being a salvation passage, okay? When he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, look, you're saved if you're a branch. You're saved if you're connected to Christ. If you're producing any fruit, you have to be saved already. So the complication comes, and a lot of people, when they interpret this passage, the complication comes from what he says about those who aren't producing fruit. Verse 4 says, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit in itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So, it, 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 there's one group of people who see this verse and say, you know, okay, well, here's the thing. If Jesus is the, they, they want to make this about salvation. And they say, okay, if Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. And if we're not producing fruit, he cuts us off and throws us into the fire. They think in their head, we're talking about hell. And so these people that aren't producing fruit are cast in hell. Okay, so that uh, immediately brings two schools of thought. One radical view is that, oh, our works is what gets us saved. And if we don't continue to do those works, then, then we're not saved. Obviously, we reject that. We understand our works don't have anything to do with our salvation. And then the other extreme is a Calvinistic view, something that we as Baptists, like we don't hold to a lot of the Protestant, ref, the Reformed kind of views, unless you're Reformed Baptist. You don't really uh, believe in all that. But what they say is, well, 
if you are saved, then you will do these works. Okay, and so they still are interpreting it like, well, if you don't do those, then you're not good for anything. You have to be cast into the fire. They're still interpreting that as somebody who goes to hell, but they're just saying, but if you're saved, you will continue to do the works. It's that, that, that preservation of the saints doctrine that, that they teach. Okay, so, uh, so both of these uh, false doctrines are based off of a misunderstanding of the text and thinking that that is talking about going to hell. But, uh, but when Jesus is, is saying this, actually, he's not even talking about going to heaven or hell. He's talking about people who are already on their way to heaven because they're saved. And he's saying that your job as a Christian is to bear fruit. Okay, so, uh, so this is the context of what he's talking about. So then, what does he mean then when he says, without me, you can do nothing? You know, what, what is it that we can't, what is it that we can't do? I mean, you might take that as a super um, literal passage and say, like, look, you can't do nothing. You can't take a breath. You can't, I mean, there's a sense in which that's true, right? Like, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus because he created all things. And, and uh, you could get real literal with that. But we have to understand in the context what he's saying that you can do nothing without me. He's talking about spiritual. Even as believers, we still walk in this flesh sometimes. But if we are not walking in the spirit, we can't produce anything for the Lord. Okay? I want to show you some verses real quick. Um, look at 2 Peter chapter 1. We go here lots of times. I realize that, but this is so important to understanding how this works. 2 Peter chapter 1. So this is, you know, most of the Bible is talking to believers and it's saying like after you're saved, like this is what you're supposed to do. Okay, so uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this, okay, this being the fact that we are saved, we've, we've obtained like precious faith and uh, through, through our faith in Jesus Christ, and beside this, giving all diligence, now we're talking about our efforts, our work, what we do, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't go here this morning in Iola, but I want to go back to, or I want to go over to 1 Corinthians. Yeah, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> I made mention of it this morning, but I didn't turn there. And I want, I want to look at this because this is, again, a pivotal thing for a Christian to understand. When it comes to our salvation, obviously Jesus Christ is the foundation. There's, there's no other foundation. Look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. When I led uh, Levi to the Lord this morning, you know, he came looking for, hey, I, I, I need some answers. I need to get my life right. I want to do this. I want to get my family situations, you know, fixed. I want to get my, all these things he's laying out. And I'm like, hey, look, first and foremost, you need to be building your life on a foundation of Jesus Christ. Building on anything else is what does Jesus say? Building on sinking sand, right? It's just, it's not going to last. You know, you have to build on this one foundation. And so we talked about his faith. We talked about the gospel. We, you know, pointed it out to him and, and showed him uh, how to know that he's saved and he's going to heaven. And so now he's got that foundation. He's, he's on that foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, now there you go again. It's our, this is our efforts of trying to do something and building upon which that, that which has already been laid. Okay, and this is fine. This is what First Peter was, or Second Peter was talking about. Uh, we're saved already, so so that has nothing. That, nothing else that we're talking about has to do with going to heaven. But now that we're saved, we need to build upon this foundation. And so here's what he says: uh, If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, 
because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. We know salvation is not a reward, right? It's a gift. Uh, but there are rewards that are going to be given to us. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay, so this idea of your works burning up, right? Anything that you do that is not in Christ, that is not the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, that is not bringing glory to the Lord, right? He's the husbandman, and so if we're walking in the vine trying to produce fruit, anything that isn't producing fruit from the Lord, at the end it's going to be burned burn up. Okay, so let's say you're, I don't know how many, anybody in here growing a garden this year? What we need to do one of these years is get together and say like, okay, you grow this, this grows well in your area. We'll grow this because we try to grow all kinds of things, and some things just don't do so well. So think about that for our future. <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, but here's the thing about a, a garden. Like, so you planted a lot of stuff, and you got a lot of vines growing up, and you got a lot of maybe even flowers or whatever. But you know, what? if they don't turn into fruit, what did you actually profit from planting a garden? Right? You spent lots of money on all these kinds of things. You could have just went to the grocery store and bought some fruit. Like, the garden is not really producing much. And all that stuff is just going to be turned into compost or it's going to be burned or, or whatever uh, because it didn't produce anything. And our lives as Christians is the same. When we get to heaven, we're going to be rewarded for those things that we did on this earth that brought glory to the Lord, that was uh, profitable for his kingdom. Everything we did in this life, and look, there's a lot of things that, hey, by all means, if you have a garden, like, make it look pretty. There's, that's fine. Make some things. You know, it doesn't all have to be fruit. <clears throat> but just know this, that when the harvest time comes, all that extra stuff didn't really matter. What matters is the fruit. And when we get to heaven, it's the same thing. Well, uh, you know, I, I spent all my time rescuing animals or going to this, uh, um, this shelter, you know, and doing all these things, uh, uh, donating to, you know, we got a big thing in Iola that's uh, – a carf, right? It's a, I don't even know what that stands for, but it's something about animals. And so, like, everything is just like donating, and then all it goes to a good cause. It goes to a carf, right? Now, look, I love pets just as much as the next guy. That's not true. You probably love pets more than I do. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that's probably in heaven not going to get you some great rewards, okay? Because you volunteered, to, uh, you know, volunteered at the uh, at the a carf, okay? I mean, by all means, go ahead and do it makes you happy it makes you know it's it, it's a it's a good thing but you better be focused as a christian on things that are going to bring glory to god and so many christians just aren't worried about that like they're not out doing soul winning they're not out trying to uh build the kingdom of god they're just out doing things that are actually works of the flesh okay so i uh, for instance you cut the vine you cut the vine off of a uh, i'm sorry you cut the branch off of a vine right and it's sitting there is it possible that it might grow something? It might grow something. It might grow mushrooms, <laughs> right? It, it might grow some bacteria or some mold. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that could grow on that, but none of it is something that's going to produce the fruit that that plant was meant to produce. You understand what I'm saying? As Christians, there's a lot of stuff we do in life that is not going, it's just our own works. It's our own efforts, but it's not really doing anything to bring glory uh, to God. And so, so when the Bible says, go back to John chapter 15, when he says here, without me, ye can do nothing, he's talking about spiritual things, okay? And, and even in, you know, 2 Peter, uh, when he talked about all those things, knowledge, uh, let's see, virtue, knowledge, temperance, all these kinds of things, those are spiritual things. Those aren't things that we are just manifesting of our own flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, he lists what the uh, works of the flesh are and what the works of the Spirit are. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> let's, start with, uh, let's start with the works of the flesh. So verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. All right, here's what you're... Here's what your branch that's not attached to, to, the, to, the, uh, um, to the vine is going to produce. And even Christians, unfortunately, can produce these things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, 
envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not in inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, none of those things are allowed in God's presence. None of those things are things that are going to inherit um, the kingdom of God. Number, uh, but verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the, affection, with the affections, there, uh, affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, so he's saying, if you're walking in the Spirit, these are the things that you're going to produce, the spiritual fruit. And as Christians, we need this. This is why we come to church, to provoke one another to good works. This is why we read our Bible. Lord, show me how I can get some of these things out of my life. Like when Jesus said in our, in our passage, he said, you are washed through the word. Okay, that's a good thing to understand. Like if you got some growth on you that's not, maybe it's a sucker. If you, if you are a gardener, maybe you know that some plants grow these little suckers and they, and they soak up a lot of energy. Right? They soak up a lot of energy from the plant, but those don't produce any fruit. They just become some growth on the plant. And it's like you got to pluck those things off. Maybe something got a little disease, and now you got all these yellow leaves that are growing, and you got to pluck off those yellow leaves, or maybe something's got some kind of bug in it. you got to get rid of those bugs. How do we do that as Christians? we got to stay in the Word. we got to hear preaching. we got to be around God's people that are going to hold us to a higher standard to say, hey, you need to be producing fruit for the Lord. And, and, and the only way that we ultimately are going to be able to produce that is when we walk in the Spirit. Okay, we're attached to the Lord. We're, we abide in the vine. And so he basically produces through us. We're just a conduit, really. Like we're not even, we're not producing any of this of our own. We're just producing what Christ um, is producing. We're just helping him to be able to do that and to do it to a greater extent. Which, by the way, he said in the last chapter, he said, you're going to do greater works than I am. This is what he's talking about. Ephesians uh, chapter 5 says very, something very similar. Ephesians 5. <clears throat> Keeping in mind what I just read, look at this one. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given, hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness... Or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So again, you can read this, you can compare this to all those other verses that I just read. They're all saying the same thing. We as Christians are, are supposed to be bearing fruit. Anything that doesn't bear fruit, it's not, it's not worth anything except to be cast into the fire, right? But as a Christian, we understand this, that the part of us that goes to heaven is not this flesh. It's not the one that still has all of these propensities to, to do these things. It's that inner man who is saved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. All right, so let me real quickly... Uh, break down some of what he's saying here. <clears throat> he's saying that when it comes to what we can't do without him, he's saying these are spiritual things okay, that, that, that you can only do when you, when you abide in him or walk in the spirit. Because remember, Jesus is about to be crucified and, and to be resurrected and go up to the Father. And so he's telling him, I'm going to send the comforter. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, I'm with you through the comforter, through the Holy Spirit. I'm with you. And so, uh, so we're abiding in him by walking in the spirit. Okay. So look at chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 9. In verse 8 he says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now he's going to explain what it means to abide in, abide in, in the vine. He says, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Okay, so one of the things as Christians that we're going to do is by keeping the commandments, 
walking in the love, like this whole passage started with the washing of the disciples' feet, and now he's just gone on and on to talk about what they're going to do as he, after he leaves. The big key here has been love, love the brothers, you know, love the saints. And so as you read through this, you understand that as, as Christians, you know, we can only do these things through the Holy Spirit, but in the flesh, we can't produce uh, we can't produce what the Spirit can produce. But here's the thing: we do have the ability to produce the even the world, even the lost people have a, an ability to produce something that they think represents these things. Okay, so so the world will say, like, I know what love means. I mean, after all, we've seen signs everywhere: love is love, right? We know what love means. People think that they know what love means. So when you're reading the Bible and you're like, oh, we got to love one another. Well, ask somebody how they know that they're, how, what they have to do to go to heaven. Well, I think, you know, if you love your neighbor, right? But what does that mean? What does it look like? I guarantee you if they're not saved, they don't understand what love means. So love becomes all of a sudden this selfish feeling, right? That I, I, I love this person so much. What it means is I have this gushy feeling for them or something like that. How about this? Uh, no, I know I love my neighbor. Here's how you know I love my neighbor. I give all of my money to my neighbors and I post pictures I post videos of it on YouTube so the whole world can see how much I love my neighbor okay well that's not really love that's a selfish desire to do something that's going to get you the applaud of men how wonderful you're just such a loving and kind person well are they really or are they just trying to get the attention of man so that they can get the applause you see what I'm saying like that is one of those works that are going to be burned up 1 Corinthians uh, 3 because it's not a love that is genuinely manufactured, or, or uh, uh, not manufactured, but generally producing some fruit for the Lord. <clears throat> we can be so loving that uh, we allow people to just love whatever they want, whoever they want, whatever they want, and do whatever they want. We're like, well, I'm just so loving that I'm just not going to get in their way. I'm just going to let them do whatever. That's not love. <laughs> you know, you don't love your child whenever you let them do whatever they want that's going to harm them and hurt them. Okay, so, uh, so the world doesn't understand love. And we, even as Christians, can fall into that mindset where, okay, I think I know what love is. No, if you're not walking in the Spirit, that's not a real love. Because that love can only be produced by the Holy Spirit. You can't produce that yourself. How about joy? He says, Jesus says in this text, he said, I, I write these things that your joy may be full. Okay, he wants you to have joy. He wants you to know that you, you have value for the kingdom. You know, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. Uh, these are the things that produce joy. But see, the world, and even Christians who are walking in the flesh, can say, like, well, I know what joy is. Joy and happiness comes from, you know, our freedom or, or getting to a point where our bank account is big enough where we can retire and we can just do all these things. Oh, that would be joy. Uh, you know, every country has a, I don't know who started it, but some organization started this happiness index, right? And the United States is kind of way down on the list. Like, you got to go to some place like Sweden or Norway or something like that because they're so happy there, right? We won't talk about the antidepressants that they got to take and all this kind of stuff. But but here's the thing, that, that index, that happiness index is based off of what the average person claims makes them happy and so all you got to do is fit into that category and it's like oh they're just such happy people here but they're not happy with the happiness and the joy that only the holy spirit can uh, can give because that happiness would produce something way better than this just like oh just do whatever makes you happy no you don't understand happiness that's a that's a work of the flesh the happiness that you're trying to produce we understand that that joy true joy of the lord is something that comes from the holy spirit and by the way interesting how often in the bible it comes through tribulation and trial and hard times you know what i mean we think joy is the, the the absence of hard times but in reality joy comes whenever we have went through a time of sorrow and then oh joy comes in the morning like knowing that you have endured something and said i'm, I'm going to endure this for the cause of christ and i'm going to put the lord first and all this and then you realize that faith produced something right that's the that faith is what's going uh, through the vine and is producing something that is going to be glo bring glory to God and not to ourselves. That's not the joy that the world offers. We understand the world tries to offer peace, you know. Uh, 
we just need to get rid of tyrants, you know, and we can have peace. We need to sign some peace treaties, and we need to, you know, not judge each other. That's one thing, you know, if you want to be at peace, we'll just stop judging people. And then we can have peace. Well, that's not, that's not what the Holy Spirit says. Holy Spirit says we need to go to that person and we need to confront that and we need to work it out so that we can have true peace that only the only the Lord can give. You know, we look to the the Bible for the answers and we and we go through the process of going to our brother, you know, asking uh, to resolve the problem, bringing another brother with us, and then bringing it before the church. That whole process that we've talked about numerous times. Okay. Now the second thing is that. Uh, when it comes to things that we can't do without Christ. The second thing is this. We cannot be made, and everybody know, un- understands this, we cannot be made righteous without Christ. Okay, It's only his righteousness uh, that, um, that gets us saved. Look at chapter 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. And in chapter 16, he's going to talk a lot about uh, again, what's going to happen after he leaves and how he's going to send the comforter. And so there's a lot of talk about that. In verse uh, 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, obviously, this applies to us in the sense that we have the comforter with us. It doesn't apply to us in the sense that we were never without the comforter. As soon as we got saved, we had the comforter. So uh, so you kind of have to consider the context. But here's what Jesus says the comforter is going to do, the Holy Spirit is going to do. In, his, in Christ's absence, here's what the Holy Spirit is going to do. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now that alone is a little confusing. And I remember trying to figure that out. Uh, what's he talking about? Reprove the world of righteousness? I mean, that seems kind of weird. What does he mean? And you have to understand that the word reprove here doesn't mean like rebuke. You know, it's not like, uh, it's not a, a judgment that he's that he's doing. It's, it's basically exposing or teaching or showing, okay? So the Holy Spirit is going to show us, teach us these things uh, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But then Jesus makes it even, to me, like a little more uh, difficult to understand. He says, of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And I just want to tell you, like to me, that seems like a hard text to, to comprehend what's going on. The best that I can make sense of it, though, and it makes total sense, uh, you know, from my, <laughs> from, from in my head, is that the Holy Spirit's job is to show us you know what? We're sinners. We cannot get to heaven without Jesus Christ. Okay, and so He says He's going, the Holy Spirit is going to reprove us of sin, show us our sin, and then it says because they believe not on Me. Well, we understand that the only way that we can be forgiven of our sins is by putting our belief in Jesus Christ and understanding Him. Which it goes on to say of righteousness because I go to the Father and He see Me no more. So the Holy Spirit has to show us that hey, our righteousness is only in Jesus Christ and faith in whom we can't see with our eyes, but we can we can believe in him and trust in him for our, our salvation, and then we are made righteous, right? And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, okay? And so the prince of this world being Satan, you know, and I talked a lot this morning uh, with Levi about this idea that, you know, if you are not a child of God, then you're a child of whom? Like you're the child of the, the devil, who's the god of this world. You know, he has a, uh, I hope he doesn't mind, <laughs> I don't know if he'll be listening to this, but I hope he doesn't mind me sharing too much, but he has like an upside down uh, star from back whenever he was a head, um, a head, head banger and stuff like that. Uh, um, he had a, a pentagram on his, on, his th- on his arm and he's like, man, I, I really would like to get this covered up because at some point he just got self-conscious of it. He was just like, I'd really like to get this covered up. Cause I don't. And, uh, and I said, look, man, without Christ, Everybody's a Satanist. Like everybody is, I know that's strong words, and a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? Look, they're going to die and they're going to go to hell if, if they're not saved, right? So therefore, Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Right. Why do, doesn't he know them? Because they're a child of the devil. Okay, and so like that's, to me, that's not that harsh of a, of, a, of a concept. When this earth was cursed after the fall, and God kind of stepped back, and now we need to seek him. We need to call on the Lord in order to be saved. Like, he kind of stepped back and let Satan kind of run his course on this earth, all right? 
And until the end where Satan's head is crushed, he's the God of this world. And, uh, and so, uh, so the judgment of evil, the judgment, uh, judgment of wickedness is on Satan, the fallen angels, all those. The Bible says that hell wasn't prepared for mankind. Hell was prepared for the, the fallen angels, right, and for Satan. But it just so happens that all those who decide to follow Satan instead of trusting in the Lord, they're going to end up going to the same place because of sin. Okay, so the judgment is going to be upon the prince of this world, upon the sin, upon all that that goes on. Praise the Lord, we escape that because we have the righteousness of Christ, which has nothing to do with the works of this flesh, but only receiving uh, what Jesus did for us and his righteousness. Okay, so, uh, so ultimately, though, here is the last point. Okay, here's the last thing, what it comes down to. What can't we do without Christ, according to the Bible? We can't even understand spiritual things without Christ. Like all of this stuff that I'm saying, we don't understand. And, and I tried to preach this message. I really felt like the Lord, this, it, was, it was pretty neat this morning. Like some things happened and I didn't, I usually have to go pick some people up and bring them to church. But I just, I, I didn't feel like I should do that this morning. And I, and I told him, sorry, some things came up. I got to take care of I'm not going to be able to get, get there. Well, what a blessing that is because I was able to hang out afterwards and talk to Levi. I didn't say, well, I've got to go take these people back, you know. Uh, but I actually stopped and gave him the gospel, which by this time I already knew God had brought him there for, for a reason, you know. Um, but the second thing is this message because I was like, you know, when I was preaching, I was like, this is the same stuff that we keep hearing over and over. It seems like I'm preaching, but I'm going through John, and this is just the stuff that is that John's teaching over and over. And so it's it's kind of the same stuff. But in my mind, whenever, whenever Levi came this morning, I was like, okay, I need to slow down. I need to try to simplify this and, and, and make it understandable. But the, you know, before, you know, when I got to sit down with him and preach the gospel, I kind of started the same place we start when we give anybody the gospel. And I'm like, so let me ask you this. You know, what do you think somebody has to do to go to heaven? Do you think you'd go to heaven whenever you die? And he's just like, well, I mean, I don't know. Like, maybe not. Uh, you know, I, but I think I'm a pretty good person. And in my head, it's like, you know, did you not hear anything that I just preached? But, yeah, he heard it. He just didn't understand it. Right, right. You have to put your faith in the gospel after it's preached to you. You have to put your faith in the gospel so the Holy Spirit can abide in you. And, bing, the light bulb can go off and you can start understanding stuff. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to understand everything in the Bible all at once. Like, I'm saved and so now I, I, I know all the answers. No, but now you can begin to learn. You can begin to lay upon that foundation. But until that point, you, didn't even, you can't even understand those things. Go to Romans 8. And I missed some verses from our text that I was supposed to read, but that's okay. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that a blessing? That's what we need to know as Christians. Hey, there's no condemnation. You're in Christ Jesus, right? You're going to heaven. <clears throat> But then we understand as Christians, what, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be walking in the Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean we're always going to do that, but as Christians, that's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay, So there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now it's going to define who those people are who, who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now you can't tell me that there's anybody out here who's saved who never walks in the flesh. That's not the point that he's making. He's like, he's like if you're a Christian, then you need to be walking in the flesh. Everything else you, I mean, I'm walking in the spirit, everything you do in the flesh is going to be burned up like we saw in 1 Corinthians 3. Okay, so that doesn't matter. That's, now it's just about what you're, doing, uh, what you're doing after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of, of life, I'm sorry, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay, you can't produce righteousness, though, without walking in the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, 
For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. This is exactly what Jesus said. Like You have to be in the, in the vine if you're going to produce anything that is pleasing to the, to the Father. You're not even in the vine if you're not saved, right? So, so you have to be uh, saved so that you can begin to understand and have the Holy Spirit enlighten you and help you walk in the way that you're supposed to walk. So I know some of this is just is, is, is basic and some of it's repetitive. We keep going over it, but this is what is hammered over and over all throughout the Bible, and John's covering it a lot. And so uh, we're just kind of going with that. So what can... what we can't do without Christ is to bear fruit for the Lord. Something that's going to glorify the Lord. We can't do that without Christ. True fruit is going to be that which honors and glorifies the Lord. And that can only come through the work of the Holy Spirit because we are, we are in the flesh otherwise. Uh, the only things that we can do from the Spirit is, uh, is when we yield ourselves and, and abide in the vine. Right? The flesh can't manufacture any of these things. In fact, it can't even understand any of these things, any of these concepts. And so if you ever find yourself trying to debate with somebody who's not even saved, you're not going to get anywhere, right? They have to believe. They've got to get saved. That's all you That's all you need to worry about first and foremost is giving them the gospel and seeing if they're going to believe or not believe. But if you start arguing with them about, you know, evolution, you start arguing with them about uh, human rights, you know, uh, my body, my choice, or anything like that, forget it. They don't understand. They're not spiritually discerned, okay? Um, and so our job is to abide in the love of Christ, let his word wash us and purge us of our sins as we you know, fall back and walk in the flesh a little bit. We have to say, man, I, I'm not producing any fruit for the Lord. How do I produce more fruit for the Lord? I gotta get some of this stuff cut out of my life and, and purged uh, so that I can produce more fruit. And then we need to bear as much fruit for the Lord as we can. You know, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. You know, I want to I wanna be on the upper end of that, of that scale. Uh, one, I guess from the fleshly perspective, because I don't know any better, I just want to be rewarded in heaven, right? But first and foremost, because I just want to serve my Father and produce lots of fruit and make him happy uh, for the work that I've done on this earth. And he's not, you know, forgetful. He's not going to forget the work that's done for him. All right, so that's the blessing uh, that we can rest on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, we, of course, thank you for our salvation and for being our Father and, and, and allowing us to be a part of the work that you've called us to. Help us, Lord, to abide in the vine that we might produce much fruit as a church and then in our families and individually. Help each of us to be purposed to that, to that end. But primarily to this morning, I want to think about just the church, and, and I pray that you help us as a church be very fruitful and to cut out any sin that might be hindering us from producing fruit. And I pray you be glorified at the end of it all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right.